Long before the reckoning of tiny creatures that measure time by the spinning of their planets around their stars in the vast gulf of space, the mad god Thara's doom had plunged a shard of ultimate evil deep into the very heart of the cosmic forge itself, that which mortals came to call the elemental chaos. On the heels of this plunging devastation, pouring malevolent fuel into the stair into the perfect order of the overgod Eos realm, the Obrinth, last survivors of their own ruined universe, fell into this newly created abyss, beyond time and space, burrowing through the planet barriers between far-flung dimensions, pockets of strange realities, demi-planes and formless voids, spreading like cancer and corrupting power of the greatest lord among them. Obox Orb ate through the multiverse like blistering acid, for the abyss was and is a living thing, the very essence of the Obrinths infusing its existence. Out of sight, but not forgotten, the gods created mortal life and it thrived. Even in this broken universe, the evil of the abyss was thought contained, but in truth, it was a vile infection, poised to burst. Among the Obrinth lords, whose true name has forever been erased from time itself, is she who is called the Queen of Chaos. Rising up in an act of ultimate hubris, she struck down Obox Arb itself, through sheer surprise, the mightiest of them fell. Only one aspect of Obox Ob surviving to skulk deep into the abyss to hide. What had spurred this insanity was the appearance of the very first mortal souls, in particular, a chance observation of that rarest of accidents, the birth of a genie. What the Queen of Chaos saw, a mortal soul, bound with an elemental spirit, creating a genie, and the power of such a resultant creature, so wild, free and powerful, she immediately sought to pull souls into the abyss and bind them to its primal essence. But it was too violent a process, as Obox Ob's corruption was too powerful and immediate. She concluded that Obox Ob must die in order for her to create her own unstoppable army. As soon as she had achieved victory, as the rest of the abyss reeled in shock, she created the very first being of the species that would be called the Tanari. But it was a wretched and twisted thing, a deformed abortion of evil with boneless arms, twin simian heads, reptilian legs and a twisted tail. Unexpected by the Queen of Chaos, the thing had drawn in the essence of the primal fears of all mortal souls. It was a snarling, roaring beast of uncontrollable fury. In disgust and frustration, she threw it aside and refined her efforts. From mortal lust, she created the succubi. She fashioned Alkyliths from sloth, turned envy into Glabrizu. She recruited the Obrinth, called the Sibriex Flesh Warpers, to create more specialized forms in far greater variety, diluting and crafting their power in order to build the perfect army. Then, when the Queen of Chaos had created a perfect demon lord, who became known as Niskia, the wolf spider. She sent her vast host boiling out of the abyss to wage a war of ultimate destruction on Elt, the Alter Multiverse, the domain of Eo and his gods and mortal life, murdering countless, countless mortal beings to fuel her fish, flesh forges and swell her demonic, demonic horde. Once more in a display of utter hubris, the Queen laid a crown on Miska's head and named him Prince of Demons, the title formerly claimed by Obox Ob. Even before the conquest of the Outer Multiverse was won, 
This time, however, her arrogance was sorely misplaced, and the forces of law led by the gods and the Windukes of Aqua smashed the forces of chaos, defeating her armies at tremendous cost to themselves, and setting in motion the events that led to the fall of Asmodeus and the creation of the devil armies of the Nine Hells. Defeated, Miska imprisoned forces scattered or destroyed, the Queen of Chaos fled to the far-flung abyssal layer called the Steaming Fen. Unleashed, the rest of the demons rose up against the Oberith masters and seized control of the abyss. For a time, such as it may, may, may be measured in the chaos of the abyss, the demons fought savagely over who would rule them and claim the title of Prince of All Demons. Two of the most powerful and cunning of the former generals of fiendish forces rose to become the most likely rulers. They are Orcus and Grast. However, in their titanic struggles against each other, through the whirling maelstrom of violence and maneuvering, neither saw the approach of a strange and deformed shadow that prowled out of the wet and forgotten depths of the dark abyss. For in all this time, as worlds shattered and new roses, races rose to shriek at the unknown night, all had forgotten that first wretched child of the abyss, and he has grown stronger and stronger in the shadows. None could withstand the power of this being when it arrived suddenly and laid waste to all that dared rise against it, for everything it slew, it absorbed their essence and power into itself, feeding on destruction and ruin. Dozens of the most powerful Tanari lords fell in battle against him, eager as they were to put him down and attack all who had been weakened in the struggle. But they were vanquished, and those who survived realized at the last that they stood in the presence of a true power. Even mighty Orcus and gifted Grast were forced to take the knee before him, their resources stupidly spent in their own wars with each other. For standing before them in all his terrible glory was the first, the primal Tanari. And while the demon host rankled and roared at his arrival, none dared raise fist, fang, or claw against the new prince. The demon Gorgon had claimed his throne. Hey there everybody, AJ back for the Mighty Gloostick channel. The following video covers one of the most formidable foes in Dungeons and Dragons history, Demogorgon. I must advise caution for those viewers who are very sensitive around the topics of demons, self-mutilation and sadistic violence. Although I won't be going into anything that has not already been printed in the pages of Dragon Magazine. Nonetheless, viewer discretion is advised. So. The real world origins of the name Demogorgon stem back to some 4th or 5th century religious scholar who probably made it up. Demon Gorgon is based on Greek and basically means a grim spirit. His name has appeared in works by Milton, Marlowe, even Melville's epic Moby Dick, believe it or not. Plus, of course, he gets a mention in the very first season of Stranger Things and becomes a nickname for the alien creatures more officially in the second season. He made his first appearance in Dungeons and Dragons in the Eldritch Wizardry sub, sub, Supplement, then of course the Monster Manual and the Greyhawk setting where he is also known as Amon Ebor and the Sibilant Beast. In the first edition of the Fiend Folio we learn that it was Demogorgon who created the very first Death Knight. However, in other settings Demogorgon, while present, is quite different. In Mistara, he is a she and a supremely powerful inhabitant of the sphere of negative uh, energy or entropy. On the world of Kryn, Demogorgon is not cited as a creator of Death Knights but is still a part of the world's lore. In Dragon Magazine number 85, in a story by Roger Moore, Tasselhoff Burfoot uh, ruins an evil wizard's attempt to summon the Prince of Demons, and when the famous Kinder meets Demogorgon's gaze ever so briefly, 
he finally experiences fear for the very first time. Demogorgon has always been with the game, although he has changed here and there, being represented with hyena heads in the Book of Vile Darkness or having the avatar reduced to some boss monster in the computer game Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Arm. Demogorgon is so iconic, particularly these days, his name is known even by people who have no idea what Dungeons and Dragons actually is. So cheers Netflix, nice one. So as with the video on Fraz Urblu, I will be reading directly from the extensive article in Dragon Magazine, the Demon Romicon of Igwilv entry on Demogorgon, written by James Jacobs, illustrated by Andrew Howe, from Dragon Magazine number 357, published in July 2007. Essentially, aside from an updated statistics block for the 5th edition adventure Hordes of the Abyss, which I'll be covering, Demogorgon and this information on him has not changed significantly in the last decade. I'll also be reading from Ed Greenwood's Ecology of the Idzit Sa Chittal, for reasons that will be clear in a few minutes, and that story by Roger Moore featuring Tasselhoff, um, I'll be reading that as well, or a part of it, an excerpt, as it has some dialogue from Demogorgon which I really like, and serves as inspiration for Dungeon Masters, and I mean, that's why I make these videos after all, to inspire you. I'll be jumping around the topic a lot, and forgive me if I get any name pronunciations wrong, I do my best. So, here we go. Demogorgon ranges in challenge rating depending on the needs of your campaign. The version of him found most recently in print is from Hordes of the Abyss for 5th edition. This version is actually pretty low powered compared to previous listings uh, at challenge rating 26. It's high for 5th edition. In the Fiendish Codex 1 Hordes of the Abyss Demogorgon is CR23 and in the Dragon article he is CR33 with suggestions that if need be he can be ramped up even higher. So. Thematically, you could say that Demogorgon is as tough as he needs to be in order to be an extremely serious threat. A good way to represent this is to have him appear in a lower CR state, in a situation where he, he has a moment to summon other demons to him, or there's some other big bad thing in the area, and Demogorgon then butchers that thing, or just tears apart a bunch of lesser demons, you know, some Balor, squad of Baragurs. As Demogorgon executes them, the player characters clearly see that the Prince of Demon draws in power from the destruction and mayhem, swelling with power alarmingly fast and then turning its rage at the characters. A clear demonstration that this is no ordinary fight and things could get way worse at any moment. In a nutshell, Demogorgon is like the Incredible Hulk of Demon Lords. He just gets stronger the angrier he gets. The more he destroys, every act of corruption um, of reality uh, only increases his power. So, in 5th edition, we see Demogorgon as an AC uh, 22, 496 hit points. He moves at 50 feet by land or sea, only his dexterity is anywhere close to as low as a very agile human. His wisdom is under 20 also. Everything uh, is at or well over 20. His strength is sufficient to have an evenly matched wrestling match with a full grown red dragon. He is immune to poison, exhaustion, being charmed or frightened. No uh, non-magical weapon can harm him. He's resist resistant to lightning, fire and cold. And although not mentioned in 5th edition, he has a permanent field of magical force around him. Exactly like the Mage Armor spell. He can use the Fly spell at will, so there's no reason why this would not be in effect whenever he's encountered. There is um, a few at will spells listed for 5th edition Demogorgon. Uh, detect magic, major image, dispel magic, fear, telekinesis, feeble mind and project image. However, his full spell capability includes a lot of spells not in the modern selection. Let's see, we have astral projection. He uses this uh, that extensively, often spending years in this realm. He can use blasphemy, contagion, desecrate, unhallow, Unholy Aura, Unholy Blight, he, so he can destroy sanctified, sanctified grounds quite easily, despoil and lay waste to any region he's in, cause the population untold sickness and suffering. He has is as potent against cleric druids and paladins as they are against undead. He routine, routinely uses Greater Teleport, Plane Shift, Gate, uh, Power Word Stun, Weird, Dominate Monster, Charm Monster, Detect Good, Detect Law, and with greater magic fang he greatly increases his mag uh, his melee attacks plus he's known to use sticks to snakes whenever he has the opportunity to render bows staves clubs and such into uh, dangerous vipers an oldie bit of goodie that spell but wait we're only just getting started on what he can do 
Demogorgon has two heads. Each has an individual personality and take a full set of actions each round. His left head, uh, Armiel, has and his right head, Hethrodiah, are quite different from each other. So we shall be talking about them in more depth later. With two heads, he has advantage on saving throws versus blinding, deafening, stunning, and any attempt to knock him unconscious. He can concentrate on at least two different things at once, so he never really lets his guard down and has a passive perception of 21, with true sight out to 120 feet. As a legendary foe, he has legendary resistance three times a day, or as I like to call it, the nope power, where he simply decides to pass the saving throw he just failed, which he can be brutal to a, uh, brutal to a party of spellcasters. His level of resistance to magical effects directed against him should be minimum advantage on all saving throws against all magic, uh, spell magic at least. Plus, he will, at higher challenge rating, have total immunity to level 1 and 2 spells, even 3rd or 4th level spells at, them at his most epic best. He should certainly have the ability to regenerate. He doesn't in Hordes of the Abyss, but Dragon Magazine version has fast healing 20 on top of almost double the 5th edition's uh, hit point total. The regeneration is not halted by fire or acid, but by cold iron and weapons of goodness, divine radiance and the like. Any attack he makes physically is considered magical, thanks to his magic fang spellcasting. His physical strikes with those long tentacles um, are fearsome indeed. First off, he has a reach of 10 to 15 feet, and each head gets an attack uh, with those tentacle arms of his. The 5th edition version gets a total of two uh, attacks with them on his turn. The Dragon Means magazine version, he gets two rounds worth of his attack actions for each round, because he's got two heads that control his body, for a total of four tentacle strikes, four bite attacks, uh, and two tail attacks. Fifth edition uses the legendary action feature to spread those attacks across the round, having them take place at the end of each uh, creature's turn. So it might be called, it might be an allied monster, not necessarily a player character, where he gets to take that legendary action on the end of their turn. He gets two legendary actions, but this is also when he gets the opportunity to use his gaze attack so it's quite often that would be what he chooses to do so the specifics of his physical strikes with those tentacle arms entail a really fast were far worse than fifth edition stat block implies not only does he do 40 12 plus 9 or an average of 35 points of bludgeoning damage the strike of the tentacle causes supernatural decay and rot unless a dc 23 constitution saving throw is made the hit point maximum of the target is reduced by the amount of damage taken and will not be restored until that creature takes a long rest. If they hit zero hit points, they die. Well, what is actually happening is that the target is being reduced to a broken rotten mess. The smashed to flesh decays instantly. Broken objects also rot away to nothing but dust and goo. In the Dragon Magazine version, the rot, this rots away flesh and bone, reducing the character's constitution score hour by hour unless a remove curse spell is cast. And even then, whoever casts it has to make a DC 30 cast level check. So it's really potent and horrible. And I would certainly say best avoided. His tail strike uh, drains the life out of any creature it strikes and heals Demogorgon. The 5th edition version does this as one of his legendary actions. With his uh, plus 17 to hit and 15 foot reach, he does 40, 10, plus 9, or an average of 31 points of damage, plus a necrotic onslaught that deals 40, 10, or an average of 22 damage. I see no reason why this could not be a grapple attack and the necrotic damage become automatically inflicted at the start of that character's turn unless they can be released somehow, or uh, Demogorgon just absorbs the life out, life out of them and tosses the dead husk aside when they're empty, healing itself to the same amount of necrotic damage he inflicted. Now, the gaze powers of the two heads are different. The effect of each can extend 120 feet and affects one target at a time per head. The DC or difficulty class of, um, of each, that's the number required with bonuses to roll uh, to save the versus this effect, is 23 and based on the wisdom score of the target. I'm just pointing this out for the no doubt many people who watch this vid but never played Dungeons and Dragons before. That's the mechanic that they use using those funny colored little dice. 
Armiel, the left head, uh, unleashes the beguiling gaze. Uh, target is stunned until the start of Demogorgon's next turn, or until he is completely out of the target's line of sight. This was formerly a charm monster spell effect. This can be represented many ways. I prefer to make it as a more interesting story-based effect, where Dem Demogorgon locks eyes on the target and forcefully uses telepathy to relay a memory of some event, the details of which are so compelling the target can do nothing as they devote every bit of their attention to it. This could be something from the distant past or a relatively immediate information, all of which is of great personal interest to the target creature. For example, it would be a cleric reliving a scene where the head of the Divine Order, their Divine Order, is at a doorway. This opens and a hooded figure in a demon mask hands the... Uh, them a mask they put it on turn to look him down up and down the street and before stepping inside this festival where some sort of ritual is taking place is it true is it a lie who knows but it's certainly compelling enough for them to stop whatever they're doing and watch the right head hethrodiah unleashes a psychic assault that inflicts insanity this is the same effect as a confusion spell and lasts until the start of Demogorgon's next turn. It doesn't require any concentration for him to, um, to keep on doing this, by the way. By focusing both heads on one target, Demogorgon can create a potent hypnotic effect. Not only is the target charmed, the demon priest prince can choose how the target moves, uses actions and reactions until the start of Demogorgon, Demogorgon's next turn. When the hypnosis gaze is used, because Demogorgon um, is using both those heads, he can't use his legendary action to make a gaze attack, thanks motorcyclist. Although not mentioned in Out of the Abyss, Demogorgon has a permanent aura of demon demonic command. Any demon within 120 feet of them, with few exceptions, um, can resist this. No demon within that range of Demogorgon can take any action without his permission, although he reflexively grants permission to each demon on its turn, unless he actively decides not to. The saving throw for any demon that tries to act against Demogorgon's will is DC 23 and a charisma based um, saving throw. Failure results in the wrath of the demon prince tearing into its mind doing 4d10 damage. Demons who are not within Demogorgon's awareness can act normally, and all those who are soul-bound and sworn to another demon lord um, can act normally, though Demogorgon will instantly know the exact nature of any bound condition on any demon within his presence. As a prince of all demons, he can summon them. The only real restriction he has on this is that he can only summon one type of demon at a time. He can't summon other demon lords or unique demons. Per day, he can summon up to 720 hit points worth of demons, or 90 hit dice worth. He can use any magic item that he wishes to, uh, and within a few moments of effort and concentration, can recreate any non-legendary or artifact weapon um, or magic item that he wants to. Okay, time to narrate directly from the text in Dragon Magazine, since it really is a superb article. I may paraphrase a bit, as some parts are not interesting to player characters, uh, players of the modern game. But um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna narrate away here, so bear with me. I'm also going to shift on to uh, the Dragon Magazine magazine article, including uh, Tassel Hot. Tesselhoff Burford. Actually, maybe I'll read that to you right now. Let's see if you like it. Uh, so um, Tesselhoff is um, he's he's witnessing the scene. With a start, Tesselhoff saw that the room was occupied. Far below, striding quietly to the edge of a circle of firepots, was a dark-robed figure. It took a moment for Tesselhoff to realize that this was the Magus. The little thief considered hiding, but his curiosity got the better of him, so he pressed closer to the bars. The magus stopped ten feet from the edge of the circle, with a smaller chalk-drawn circle inside it. For a time he appeared to contemplate the flames before him. Ruddy light played over his drawn face, white like a ghost's. His dark eyes drank in light, reflecting none. Slowly the magus raised his arms to call out the circle of fire in a language the kinder had never heard before. At first the flames crackled and jumped, but as the Magus continued speaking, the fires dimmed and lowered until they were almost invisible. The air grew colder and Tesselhoff shivered, rubbing his arms for warmth. Tesselhoff's attention was suddenly drawn to the center of the conjuring circle. Red streaks appeared in crisscross patterns on the floor within the design of the firepots, as if the floor were breaking apart over red lava. 
A dull haze clouded the chamber, and the firepots burned more brightly. A strange roaring like a great ocean wave coming in to the shore filled the room by degrees, growing to a thunder that made the very rock tremble. Tasselhoff gripped the bars before him, wondering if an earthquake had been conjured by the sorcerer's powers. Far below, the magus called out three words. After each word, light and flame burst from the centre of the conjuring circle. Each flash stung the kinder's eyes, but he could not look away from the sight. Yellow magma glowed with superheated radiance within the circle, dimming the light from the firepots around it. A wave of heat and reddened Tasselhoff's face and arms, where the furs he wore did not cover him. The magus could see, did not seem affected by the heat at all. One last time, the dark figure called out, speaking a single name. Tasselhoff thought he heard. Uh, he he thought his heart would stop when he heard, and he recognised it. The thundering roar vanished, vanished instantly, an airy silence filled the air for the space of six heartbeats. With a screaming whistle, the lava in the circle vanished entirely and were replaced by darkness, streaked with an eye-burning violet light, resembling an impossible opening into the night sky. Tasselhoff was straining to see into the pit when a thing of titanic size arose from it out of the, right, the night pit and into the room. Tasselhoff had heard rumours about the thing that stood before him, but he had never truly believed it until now. The thing towered over the Magus, three times the height of a man. Two great tentacles dangled from its shoulders in place of normal arms, and two great heads maned with black fur rested where one head should be. Scales glittered over its skin, and in the light of the firepots, the thief saw its feet were clawed like those of a bird of prey. Slime and oil fell from it, the droplets smoking when they struck the stony floor. The heads gazed down upon the magus. Inhuman mouths spoke, their rasping voices out of time with one another by a fraction of a moment. Again, the voices said, you call me from my place of the abyss to defile my, pres your, my presence with your own. You summon my divine person to fulfill your petty desires, and you tempt my everlasting wrath. Sorely I wish to have vengeance on this world for you, for giving you birth. You who toys with the prince of demons like a slave, I thirst for your soul like a dying man for water. I did not summon you to hear your problems, responded the Magus in a cracked thin voice. Bound you are to me, bound by the circle. You shall hear me out. With screams that made Tasselhoff jerk from the bars and cover his ears, the thing's heads shot down at the Magus and were thrown back by unseen forces that sparkled and flashed like lightning. The thing's tentacles writhed and flailed the air like titan's whips. Ah, oh, wretch! You speak to me so ten thousand times you are cursed. Should these bonds fade ten thousand times, I will break you in my coils until your dark soul rots. For several minutes, the demon roared out its rage. The Magus stood before it, unmoved and silent. In time, the thing ceased to cry out. Its breathing became a slow, ragged thunder. Speak, the heads said venomously. There is an adventurer in my fortress, said the Magus, who wears a green stoned ring. The ring will not leave his hand and defies magical attempts to remove it. It teleported the adventurer into my citadel when it was not his intention to do so. What ring is this? How do I remove it? What are its powers? The thing twisted its necks. You summon me to identify a ring? Indeed, said the Magus, and waited. The twin heads dipped closer to the Magus. Describe the largest stone. An emerald the size of my thumb, rectangular cut with six tiers and no flaws. The face was engraved with a hexagonal sign, with a smaller hexagram set within, and another in that one. Silence filled the dark room. Even the thing's writhing arms were stilled. After a pause, the thing stood upright. Its heads turned about independently of each other. Tasselhoff shrank back against the opposite wall of the tunnel as a head turned his way. The head stopped when it looked into the barred window of the air shaft. Red fires arose in its eyes and ran through Tasselhoff like spears. Tasselhoff Burfoot had never known fear, though he had seen sights that made him hardened man shake with terror. When the eyes of that thing were upon him, he shook without breathing, his soul filled with a new emotion. 
Something like a smile ran over the lips of the thing's face. The head turned slowly away. Magus, said the thing. Concern yourself not with the ring. Turn your pleasure to other matters. You probe the reaches of unseen planes and manipulate the destiny of, of worlds. Neither the ring nor its wearer, wearer will be your concern past the setting of the sun this day. There was a large long silence during which neither monster nor summoner moved. That is not the answer I asked of you, said the Magus. For a time there was no response from the thing. Its heads chuckled heavily and the sound rolled across the room. I have spoken, it said, then vanished in the circle of violet light and darkness as if it had always been a shadow. Pretty good. Alrighty, on to the article. Although there are certainly more dangerous things dwelling in some corners of the abyss, few can match the unbridled fury of Demogorgon enraged. If he can, Demogorgon always prefers to initiate combat while astrally projecting or while using project image. If he can use both projecting an image of an astral projection, so much the better. The Prince of Demons is rarely encountered alone, but in the unusual circumstance that he is, one of his first actions, preferably before combat, is to summon large numbers of Balors, or Garistros, to aid him. When facing potent foes, he usually uses Gate to call in even more powerful allies, such as uh, Belcheresk or Saint Kargoth, the Betrayer, the first of his um, Death Knights. Once combat begins, Demogorgon moves quickly to enter melee with the most powerful foe, taking advantage of his reach as appropriate. He uses his dual action ability to move and make a full attack, following on successive rounds by continuing fuller attacks with spell-like abilities. He's particularly fond of causing, uh, casting st sticks to snakes on wooden weapons wielded by his foes, plane shifting clerics and bards to the... Uh, negative energy plane or the shadow fell and using dominate monster or charm monster to recruit allies from his enemies in addition he's careful to hit foes with quickened greater dispel magic as soon as possible since he knows spells like hero's feast mind blank and death ward are favorites that tend to hinder many of his attacks he generally targets healers with his quickened feeble mind and demogorgon doesn't wait to cast heal on himself doing so whenever needed to demoralize foes and recover from wounds He'll usually cast it on himself once he's been reduced to 500 hit points or less, or in that case, 250. If he's forced to use all of his heal spells and his foes continue to persevere against him, uh, he's not above flight. His preferred method of escape is to use a gate to call in a powerful ally and then teleport away immediately after using his second action for that round. His goals. As the oldest of Tanari, Demogorgon has eons to plot and scheme. While some of these goals he has long since realized, such as the conquest of the Blood Shallows, the destruction of the realm of Nagal, and the creation of the Retrievers, and others he has abandoned, such as the transformation of the Isle of Dread into a new abyssal realm under his control, he settled for controlling this region by proxy instead, and the subjugation of the Material Plains Kraken population, the Kraken have, are far too Machiavellian for their own good, and they make poor minions, so he's abandoned that scheme. The Prince of Demons retains an impressive list of goals that usually extends, uh, exceeds any other demon lord. The reason for this is simple. Demogorgon is, in many ways, two creatures who share one body, and each of these creatures has enough goals for anyone. Perhaps the most famous of Demogorgon's goals is the destruction of his two greatest enemies, Orcus and Grast. The three demon lords have been locked in battle since the dawn of the Tanari, and while both Orcus and Grast uh, spent some time dead or in prison, Demogorgon has never been fully defeated, um, and he's never defeated either army, for when he moves against one, the other's forces are always there to strike at his flanks. If Orcus and Grass should ever set aside their own hatred for each other, the combined forces could theoretically dethrone the Prince of Demons, but they never do. Beyond his hatred of these two, Demogorgon fights other wars as well. Fraz Urblu has, uh, has used his deceptive powers to lure Demogorgon into embarrassing and needless conflict many times, enough that Demogorgon often sends his armies to Hallow's Heart to test the defences of Fraz Urblu. He once took and held half of Fraz Urblu's realm and was poised to defeat the other when he was forced to return to Gaping Moor and defend it against incursions from one of his other great enemies, Zurigorex the Tanari demon lord of storms and the drowned dead. Zerigorex had long lusted for the waters of Gaping War and led an army of undead and uh, demonically filled air elementals against Lemor. 
Lemorex when Demogorgon assaulted Hello's heart. Demogorgon returned just as Urigarex began to dismantle the gates of his palace of Ungol, Un, bleh, Ungorith. Uh, so infuriated was Demogorgon at the double insult of being torn from one sure victory and having to, his home defaced that he slaughtered Zurigarex's army and pursued the Lord of the Drowned Dead all the way back to the 480th layer of the Abyss, Guttelvich, the realm of endless shipwrecks, hurricanes and blood-soaked beaches. Demogorgon destroyed the realm, sinking islands and turning the waters against Zurigarex, who in the end had to abandon his lair and flee to the Scalding Sea to finally escape. Gatilvich remains this, to this day, although um, it's in ruins. Some whisper that Zurigarex has, in secret, built uh, returned to rebuild his realm. And then, of course, there is uh, Obox Ob, an ancient Oberth Lord, the first prince of demons. Demogorgon knows that Obox Ob still lives, festering in the depths of Zonin down below the very foundation of the abyss. He has survived many assaults and assassination attempts from the Prince of, of Vermin, some quite close, and has, for his own part, never managed to pro progress further into the enemy's realm. If Demogorgon fears one foe, it's probably Obox Ob, for while Demogorgon, inherit, Demogorgon inherited the role of Prince of Demons, Obox Ob was that role's inception. Yet, not all of the Demon Lords are Demogorgon's enemies. Most of them acknowledge his power paying proper respect when required, but taking great pains to avoid placing themselves in situations where they could attract his attention. Few are the demon lords who actually count him as an ally. The Queen of Fungi, Zugitmoy, often visits the screaming jungle, spreading new strains of fungus while gathering more for her own gardens. She often visits Demogorgon on those journeys to discuss matters better left unsaid. Mighty Dagon, the Oberonth Lord of the Deep who dwells in Shadow Sea below Gaping Moor, often serves Demogorgon as an advisor, drawing upon eons of lore to aid Demogorgon's goals. In return, Demogorgon allows Dagon's minions to scavenge the Brine Flats for petitioners and other treasures. And one must not discount Feral Ilsidur, the Demon Lord of the Simeon Baraglurus, who guards the landward approach to Gaping Moor. Isidur, who once aided Demogorgon in reopening the shining vortex of Mesna, a portal that once connected the abyssal woodlands of Morakayan with the Olympian glades of Arborea, one of many portals used eons ago by the Eladrin court to invade the abyss and finish the job against the Oberons that the Windukes of Aqua started. Demogorgon and Ishid uh, Hur managed to cause a fair amount of devastation bef there before the enemies clashed with those of an Eladrin paragon. Although she pushed them back through the shining vortex of Mesna, she herself was forced to remain in the abyss abyssal side to ensure its permanent closing and was soon thereafter captured by Demogorgon. Only the fact that the two demon lords wasted days arguing over how best to des desecrate torture and ultimately slay the uh, the uh, divine champion uh, this granted her the um, an ally of hers time to come in and rescue her and uh, it's been a point of contention between the demon lords ever since that this happened that their bickering and arguing resulted in such a prize escaping their clutches finally even a creature as feral and murderous as demogorgon has lusts he has consorts through the ages and has been varied um, in his desires ranging across the entire abyss and all it has to offer but recently his tastes have seemed to run to the human form for many decades his lover was the succubus shami amore but when demogorgon discovered shami amore had been manipulating his personalities for her own gain he had her imprisoned in the well of darkness for eternity he has since taken up with the queen of succubi who um who was actually the one that opened his eyes to the betrayal of um, Shami Amore. These two unlikely demons have sired all manner of horrific offspring, most of which uh, have been um, they've been content to let loose in the gaping moor, since their forms tend toward nauseating. The most powerful of these monstrous scions is without a doubt the beast named Arendagrost, a monster that even Demogorgon finds unsettling to look upon. Uh, the mother herself has used Demogorgon's split personalities for her own amusement, ironically, abusing the Prince of Demons in the same way as, as his previous lover. 
That Demogorgon's two heads have distinct personalities is widely known, yet few realise the extent to which the two heads detest and loathe each other. Demogorgon's left head, Emil, the more charismatic and char uh, calculating of the two, while Demogorgon needs to lay uh, complex plans, interact with other powerful beings or leaders, armies and address dominions, it's Amiel who does the majority of the talking while his other head glowers and sneers menacingly. This head, the right, is named Hethrodiah. This personality is the more savage, feral and impulsive of the two, generally incapable of plotting anything beyond the immediate. It is the wrath of Hethrodiah that is the most of Demogorgon's enemies feel when the demon, demon prince is roused to anger. Emil and Hethrodiah's greatest enemies are each other. Both believe that they would be much more powerful without the other's meddling, yet neither believes they can live without the other. Over the eons, both heads have tried countless plans to end the schism that rules them. Yet to date, none of these plans have succeeded. The most recent attempt involved a theory of Amul's in which he intended to use a demonic, soul-infused, raw soul energy uh, from the bastion of unborn souls to cauterize the mortal wound that would surely result from Hethrodiah's murder. He was planning on chopping the head off. Yet this plan collapsed in on itself when the mortal slew the half-fiend dragon Ashardalon and the only entrance to the bastion closed. Ironically, it is Hethrodiah, the impulsive and feral personality, who might have discovered the only real way to end Demogorgon's divided existence. Always before, the Prince of Demons had thought his problem as something to be solved by destruction, yet after causing a wash of madness and feral ruin to destroy the Empire of Thanaclan on the Isle of Dread, and bathing in the resulting energies unleashed by the savage tide, a plan began to form in Hethrodiah's scattered mind. It took nearly a thousand years for this plan to congeal, but now Hithrodiah moves with purpose, allowing Amul to believe that the idea was his own, and Demogorgon has prepared a massive, savage tide for the material plane. If successful, Demogorgon intends to use the savage tide to fuel the transformation in which his personalities will absorb each other, transforming him into something beyond a mere prince of demons. Demogorgon intends to become their king. His cult, most numerous supporters in the material plane, are without a doubt the Ixit Zhachitl, a race of intelligent and highly evil rays, like stingrays, manta rays, that dwell in the deeper reaches of the seas. They're related to cloakers. Ixit Zhachitls rarely come to the, into contact with surface dwellers, and thus much of their air-breathing world remains content with the belief that the Prince of Demons has relatively few worshippers in the world. It's not true. The next most common worshippers of the Prince of Demons are the Troglodytes. While most of these reptilian humanoids venerate their own deity, Logzed, in ages past, large numbers of heretics venerated Demogorgon as their true deity. The faithful of Logzed waged many crusades against the dawn of modern civilization, uh, civilization to put the demon worshippers can down, and as a result, Demogorgon worshipping tribes of troglodytes are quite rare and generally restricted to remote locations in the deep jungles on distant isles. Now and then, adventurers shame, stumble upon ancient temples of Demogorgon thrust back up to the surface by earthquakes or otherwise returned to the world. These ancient temples are often guarded by slumbering priests placed in suspended animation in tribes of awakened simians who view their temples as their birthright. It is not these cults of troglodytes and exitsar chittles that proved the most dangerous, for they dwell in remote corners of the world. Far more dangerous are the smaller cults of debased humanoids in the underbelly of large cities or in forgotten ruins found dangerously close to the civilized world. These cults are small, rarely numbering more than a few dozen and more often consisting of one or three worshippers of the Prince of Demons, who have seized control of a larger tribe, using their magic and menace to lead them astray, while keeping the truth of their worship a secret. Likewise, many evil sorcerers and wizards turn their lives to the study of Demogorgon, hoping to gain some measure of mastery over the abyss, and not always realizing that Demogorgon himself orchestrates their goals and actions. Most of his worshippers are the lowest of the low, pirates, murderers, and even cannibals, and in the worst cases, these cults control their societies, evil theocracies that rule by terror and violence. Sacrifices to Demogorgon vary widely, but always involve the slaughter of an innocent. 
Demogorgon vastly prefers the souls of his enemies, uh, his good aligned clerics, paladins and rangers who devote their lives to the destruction of all things demonic are widely known to be his favourite targets. And many of these cultists go to unusual lengths or great risk to capture these sacrifices. Wizards and sorcerers who seek his knowledge often make sacrifices to the Prince of Demons as well, while their motivations are generally more self-centred and even um, these sacrifices um, are done by proxy, they still please the Demon Prince just as well. And uh, yeah, even though they're not the ones performing the sacrifices, they're still orchestrating them, so they're still pretty evil. The actual method of sacrifices varies, but generally involves the conjuration of a demon for um, committing the actual killing blow. With a properly observed ritual, the soul of the person sacrificed in this manner is carried directly to Lemoriax, where it is steeped in a vile flesh forges and transformed into a larvae, even if the soul itself is not destined for such a fate. This is one of the very few instances in which an innocent soul can become a larvae. These tragic victims are said to be particularly valuable, valuable to fiends in the soul trade, and is that fact that Demogorgon controls this method of their creation is one of the several reasons he has remained in power for so long. He can garner allies by having these larvae, which actually feel suffering. Rituals involving their own faithful are no less reprehensible. Uh, Worshippers of Demogorgon often partake of drug fueled violent orgies and mass murders, all in the name of the Prince of Demons. One of the most disturbing of these rituals is the Feast of Self, in which a prospective thrall of Demogorgon must offer himself to a conjured demon, allowing the demon to use his body for whatever nameless lusts that demon desires. This portion of the ritual damages the participant's body and mind, dealing uh, 2d6 points of constitution and charisma damage, or in this case, so it'll be an inflicted insanity. Where, uh, or, of course, levels of exhaustion that don't go away. Whenever the demon rewards the hopeful thrall by... Um, uh, when over, sorry, the demon rewards the hopeful thrall by opening the participant's skull with a claw and scooping out a small portion of the brain. The demon eats the brain matter and then regurgitates it into the aspirant's mouth for consumption. This results in another point, 1d4 points of constitution damage and 2d6 points of intelligence drain, which is typically restored later via a restoration spell. In this manner, the devouring, by devouring one's own brain, symbolizing the split in Demogorgon's own mind, an initiate becomes a thrall of Demogorgon. Many do not survive this ritual, but those who do are forever transformed and it's um, it's a powerful presence indeed. Clerics of Demogorgon have access to the domains of chaos and evil and if you use the Fiendish Codex 1 in your campaign the clerics also have access to corruption and demonic domains otherwise replace access to these domains with destruction and water. Uh, Demogorgon's symbol is a forked tail his priests often make use of strange and primeval magic, favouring spells that have long since fallen out of favour, such as the um, aforementioned sticks to snakes. And to be, uh, becoming a thrall of Demogorgon basically transforms you physically into a demonic being. You get demon flesh, um, your arms become extendable tentacles, uh, you get armoured scaly hide and you look thoroughly horrible and go about your business basically murdering people and destroying things. Um, acts of destruction is seen as, as seen as worship so you get the scaly legs and uh, and tentacle type arms and scaly skin and a monstrous face and yeah look quite revolting so we'll skip over that uh demogorgon's minions are the demons of the abyss while not all demons view him as their master all demons if begrudgingly acknowledge him as their prince in many cases the chaotic nature of demon kind urges rebellion and hatred against demogorgon yet most of those who stray close to his proximity find themselves his slaves many demons have embraced this lure and serve him as faithfully as any demon can of these none can match the power wielded by the balor beltresque a um a fighter of a battle kind perhaps the demon's best position to inherit demogorgon's realm if ever beltaresque serves also as the supreme commander of demogorgon's prodigious army this force of demons monsters half fiends planner mercenaries and constructs is a vast force indeed at any one time only a fraction of demogorgon's army can be found on gaping moor entire contingents of a million strong 
are permanently stationed on other layers of the abyss to provide protection for the Prince of Demons' many plots, while others fight endlessly on the lower planes to ensure Demogorgon's interests are extended. His Rowls, Rastralists, Skullvanes, Barglurs, and Balor are common in his realm of gaping war, yet his true favourites are the creatures he has crafted himself. Demogorgon is a master of the art of shaping demonic life. Most believe those he stole these uh, secrets from the Sibriax Oberiths, but Demogorgon claims his gift as a result of being the first Tanari. Retrievers are likely his most uh, infamous creations, immense spidery constructs the size of elephants gifted with the ability to unerringly track down and retrieve those who have wronged the Prince of Demons. Lesser known constructs built by the Prince of Demons are the um, these large stony golem monstrosities imbued with many of Demogorgon's own traits and crafted in his image. Uh, these are the Lemurian golems, and they serve as guards and soldiers in the crooked avenues of Lemuriax, the streets of his capital city, thronging with a specialized half fiends known as Lemurians, demonic soldiers crafted in Demogorgon's flesh forges. Lesser well known, much more deadly, are the Orlath demons, created from several of Demogorgon's teeth that broke off and lodged the flesh of a powerful, powerful Marilith prince the demon slew. Orlath demons are often sent to the material plane to aid his cults and demonic, as demonic diplomats and assassins. Um, of course, the most feared and monstrous of his creations are, without doubt, the Death Knights because of their effect on humanity and um, elven nations and things. These undead soldiers are forged from the flesh and souls of only the most vile and reprehensible uh, living champions, and none are more vile than those corrupted from once righteous and holy men and women. The first Death Knight, Sir Cargoth the Betrayer, still served Demogorgon on Gaping War, but many others have sp- um, have been spawned since then, and the secrets of creating the Death Knights have long since been stolen by several of Demogorgon's enemies. None can match the Prince of Demon's skill at creating these um, undead champions, however. Perhaps one of the most obscure tales of crafting, and yet likely the most powerful entity created by the Prince of Demons, is the Ravenous Moor itself, as of Adexus. The tale of Azuvadexus's genesis is perhaps one of Demogorgon's greatest triumphs. Eons ago, Azuva Dexus was a demon lord of primeval beasts and scaled nightmares. The forgotten lord dwelled in a steaming jungle covered in layers of um, a layer of the abyss known as Nigaro. And despite countless assaults on the realm, Demogorgon was unable to defeat Azuva Dexus. So he took a new tactic, forging a truce with his enemy and aiding him in creating a particularly dire cult on the material plane, the cult of the Ravenous Moor. Once this cult was up and running, Demogorgon stepped back and watched, knowing what would happen next. For the region in which he had helped Azubadexus establish the cult was under the protection of a particularly territorial pantheon of deities. When the Ravenous Moor infested the ancient city of Balia and murdered the, the priests of the High Temple, the pantheon reacted swiftly. Its member gods descended upon the abyss and tore free Nagal, using their considerable power to condense the entire layer down to the size of a human head, trapping Azuvadexus within. Yet the deities of this forgotten pantheon did not expect the abyss itself to react as it did. Even as they cast Nagal into the astral plane, the void left behind by the layer's destruction lashed out. The abyss itself reacted reflexively like a hungry predator awakened from an eons long torpor. It struck at those deities to dare destroy even such a fragmentary part of it, and in an instant annihilated the entire pantheon. All that remained were the pantheon's memories and dreams, and the abyss seized even these. Today, the empty space that once held Negral is known as the Dreaming Gulf, and the dreams of those dead deities have been transformed into an entirely new race of demons known as the Iomaras. This incredible upheaval caught even Demogorgon by surprise, and certainly the gods of the Astral Sea. He intended only for Azu Vedexus to be murdered by the outraged Pantheon, yet when he realised what had happened, the Prince of Demons retreated to his Iron Citadel in Puzunaya and projected into the Astral Plane. After several years of searching, he recovered the Nergaral Seed and took it with him back to the Zunaya. Uh, creating a gate and he cast the seed into the jungle in the material plane. Once it arrived here, a curious thing happened. The seed bonded with the jungle surrounding itself on, and its arrival point, transforming the area into a smaller version of the, um, its former glory. Likewise, the inhabitants of the jungle were warped and became fiendish mockeries of the original um, self. 
Eventually, a large Tyrannosaurus, driven insane by an infestation of brain parasites, stumbled upon the Nugal seed, mistook it for food, and ate it. The seed instantly transformed the dinosaur, infusing it with the power and wrath of a dead demon lord and his abyssal realm. And as demonic brilliance and evil took root in the great dinosaur's spirit, Demogorgon arrived to offer support and advice. Today, Azuvidexus rules a region known as the Crawling Jungle, carrying out Demogorgon's wishes, and by betraying an ally and sacrificing a pantheon, Demogorgon not only defeated an enemy, he rebuilt him as a slave, and as a side effect, the Abyss birthed an entire new race of demons. That's the sort of thing that Demogorgon gets up to. So Demogorgon's realm, he rules the 88th layer of the abyss known as the Gaping Wall. This realm, like Demogorgon himself, is a land divided. An immense landmass sits on the edge of, a, of the realm, and uh, it's a primeval region covered with trackless tropical forests and vast bogs and fens. This is the Screaming Jungle, a place populated by fiendish lizard folk, fiendish troglodytes, demons, and Yuanti cultists. Near the interior, the land hardens and rises into the jagged clefts of a hidden plateau, ruled by Agbaraglurus and other demonic simians. Perhaps the most deadly uh, menaces of the Screaming Jungle are the primi primordial Verakias, demons that ruled here long before Demogorgon claimed the place as his own. Those who climb far enough up into the region eventually emerge into the Guttering Grove, the 90th lay of the Abyss. The, um, by the way, the Verakias are incredible foes, a monstrous creature with a... Uh, draconic lower body with a long spiked tail and reptilian feet front two of which include large gutting talons its upper torso is more humanoid with large and powerful arms that end in two fingered hands and the inner finger of each hand is larger than the other and ends in a large scythe-like claw with a serrated inner curve its head has four eyes and an immense mouth with a long snake-like forked tongue two horns angled down uh, like that of a bull or a black dragon and a third horn runs back from the rear of its head. Red smoke pours from the corner of its, of its mouth, and the inside of the throat glows with fire. So it's a fire-breathing, massive, multi-armed killing machine. And yeah, they're very, very difficult to kill, and I would certainly avoid them. So yeah, that's uh, that's Demogorgon for you. Um, now I'm going to briefly touch upon the... Um, uh, the exit, uh, sorry, the um, exit Zach, exit Sarchital. Uh, and this is from Ed Greenwood's article from uh, 1984, Dragon Magazine, from the ramblings of Volume Five of the Sage of Volume Four of the Sage Ninemith, a curious creature indeed. The Ixitchas are chittle found in colonies of sometimes as many as a hundred or more in shallow tropical seas. Ixits are chittle typically lair well-concealed grottos or tunnels in the midst of coral reefs. They worship the Prince of Darkness, um, uh, the Prince of Demons, Demogorgon, and from him gain a, the use of clerical spells in some creatures, rising in ability to equal that of a patriarch, or basically a cleric. Although they are very seldom encountered by humans and humanoids who travel in or out of the seas, the exits are chittal are numerous and rule large areas of the coastal sea salt waters of the world, relying on their aggressive nature and their magical powers to build an undersea empire of sorts. Exits are chittal carnivorous and prey on all marine life they can kill and devour, even extending at times when they can attack in large, huge hunting packs to giant octopus, whales, and or on at least one occasion, a dragon turtle. The creatures range far from their lairs in search of food and often battle Sahawagan, Lacanth, and especially Tritons and Mermen. The superior organization and tactic of these opponents have earned them victory over the Exodar Chittle, often enough to keep these magically endowed rays from destroying all resistance and mastering all of the oceans. But at the same time, the Exodar Chittle has certainly made their presence felt, and in some areas of the world, they have all but eradicated aquatic elves in warm seas, and the Tritons have largely found it easier to make their abodes in deeper waters, and only venture around uh, the shallower areas as a result um, yeah, of the exit archival moving out of the area. Because of the enmity between Orcus and Demogorgon, intelligent marine undead, like ants, juju zombies, and so forth, will not aid and sometimes will actively oppose the rays. Exits are chittal for their part devour any such prey wherever it can be found, so the undead largely avoid exits are chittal. 
Those raised with especially powerful cleric abilities can raise additional recruits for their armies by use of the animate dead spell, but are unable to magically control or influence undead because of the influence of Orcus against, uh, against them and offers them too much resistance. In battle, they uh, swoop rapidly at opponents um, from opposing directions and different levels of the sea, seeking to confuse prey by striking them from more than one side at once. In this manner, they are often led by a... Um, a so-called vampire variety, which are envied and personally uh, become powerful war leaders and influential individuals in their society. The most uh, powerful vampire versions of these servants of Demogorgon, which are the social leaders of the Exodus Archital Society, hang back until the single most powerful opponents are identified, whereupon they'll attack with spells. These powerful spell users typically sweep together two or more of other, other Exodus Archital, so that when the target will um, come at them, they basically get hampered in their attacks. So they bring other forces in, in front of themselves to protect them while they uh, fling spells. Sometimes Exodus will burrow into bottom sand, leaving only their eyes covered to escape dangerous foes, but more often they will do this to lie in wait for speedy prey, where they'll then spring up and ambush. In a manner similar to a way that sharks do, Exodus Archital sense uh, vibrations from great distances underwater by means of receptors on their backs and tails. The shockwaves of explosions, for instance, can be heard from miles away. They can have a form of speech in which they can communicate openly with one another and with some Sahuagan that they've learned at least the rudiments of their strange tongue. And those Exodus Archital with access to proper spells can also communicate magically with other creatures. They have a second form of language they can use among themselves and with some other marine creatures, such as Sarwagon, which is described as touch telepathy. This is a form of limited mental exchange possible only by creatures that have this super sensory touch ability, um, and only by touching, and usually with their tails. Groups of exarchitals sometimes swim in stacks, with fins beating in unison, one on top of another, belly to back. This is believed to be a form of this mental communication, transmitting emotions or general thoughts and not a mating or courting behaviour. The devil rays, as they are sometimes mistakenly called, all appear externally identical to each other, but um, the exit archital can apparently distinguish sexes and individuals readily at a distance. Each creature mates once a year at varying times, uh, there's no breeding season per se, and the process is initiated by the female who chooses sometimes aggressively a male partner. And by this method, some sages argue the females deliberately attempt to breed to improve the race. Certain Exodar chittle grow to um, in strength and power upon becoming adults, and it, this um, group becomes the colony's leaders and decision makers, but only those that are accepted by their fellows are allowed to live long enough to attain this status. So it's a pretty hard society. Potential leaders are deemed um, unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory by whatever standards the Exodar use, perhaps disrespect or uh, disloyalty to Demogorgon and are set upon by the group and slain before they have a chance to force themselves into positions of influence and power. This weeding out process that destroys many of these special exits are chittle helps them explain why the creature has not risen in power, uh, positions of absolute power or dominion in the seas because their um, their ruthless uh, control of their own populace is actually a hindrance to their power, their homogeny of belief. Um, is damaging to their innovation of their individuals so yeah that's that's them so they sometimes cooperate with other aquatic creatures such as sea hags or other sahawagan or lacanth for mutual gain and have been known to hire or train creatures such as sea lions to work for them sharks can seldom be, uh, be thus used by their cousins exit sharks at all for sahawagan have long employed sharks in their battles against the rays and sharks seem to have acquired a dislike for the dark rays or perhaps they merely recall exit sharks at all flesh is um, not as tasty more details of exodactyl life are few and not well documented and understandably difficult to augment, but research on this subject, notably by esteemed colleagues uh, Razimuth, uh, Ramazith of Abelda's Gate and uh, some certain scholars of the Moonshay Isles, continues. So, ladies and gentlemen of the internet, that is Demogorgon for you. I hope you enjoyed this rather lengthy video, but I think um, as a major player in Dungeons & Dragons, he certainly deserves the treatment. And if you enjoy such long lay videos, please let me know. And if you don't, please let me know also. And also uh, let me know what sort of other demon prints or um, other major force of the multiverse of Dungeons and Dragons you'd like to hear about next.
as for me i'm going to be carrying on with some more dragons and other things that strike my fancy thanks for listening everyone i'll catch you again soon